let's fast forward to more recently. Um, McClintock's successor in biology is a guy at the University of Chicago named James Shapiro. Shapiro. Okay. And he, he's done, he's continued her line of thought. Okay. And, and by the way, McClintock's discovery of this, when she discovered this, it was, it was so mind blowing that for 20 years, her colleagues wouldn't even believe her. Okay. They, they didn't even have a framework for conceiving, for conceiving that. The, the, okay. that the genome could be that sophisticated. That happens in science once in a while, right? right. A paradigm shift kind of yeah. a thing. Right? And actually, for, for quite a while, she stopped publishing her work, and she just yeah. worked in her lab and did Is her Is there notes. a name for this? It's called, um, it's called transposition. And McClintock called it transposition. Um, Shapiro has, uh, has ex extended it further, and he calls it cellular genetic engineering okay okay and so and so here, here's what happens so Shapiro takes a protozoa and he puts it in a very hostile environment okay, mm -hmm. okay. and here's what he discovered a protozoa under stress would splice its own DNA into a hundred thousand pieces rearrange a hundred thousand segments of DNA and reassemble them and the new protozoa would be adapted to its new environment randomly is there a randomness in any of that no it's Shapiro is emphatic this is not random it's somehow that there's a there's a program yes for it to do that yes now, as a communications, yes. Yeah, what layer is that at? <laughs> it has to be at the top layer. Okay. Okay, think about this. Let's say, let's say that you wanted, a, a, you wanted to write me a letter, but you wanted the letter to be able to rewrite itself. You wanted the letter to be able to, like, let's say, um, let's say it wasn't getting the result it, it wanted. If you program the ability to sense its environment and go, let's rearrange the paragraphs, let's rearrange the sentences, because we, we humans do that. I'm in advertising. We put an advertisement out there. Mm -hmm. It gets a certain response. We go, let's rearrange the letters, let's change the words, and let's see if we get a better response. Right. Okay. Well, he finds out. And, and now, would it, is it ridiculous to, to think that if, if an author was rewriting a book, he might make 100,000 little changes? No. Move this sentence over here, move right. this paragraph over here, re change the order of these two chapters, fix these things, right? Mm -hmm. People do this, mm -hmm. and it's top down. Right. If, if you had a document that did that, it would be top down. You'd have to know, you'd have to have a good understanding of the ideas in that document before you could right. improve it. Right? And it would have to have a governing program mm -hmm. that supervises this process. It's not going to rearrange it at the bottom, it's going to rearrange it from the top down. So is Shapiro considered to be a kook in the scientific no, world? He's not. Stuff is credible? He's not. Shapiro is very interesting. He refuses to take sides in the intelligent design debate. He, he, won't, he won't identify himself as, he, he, he is not a Darwinist, okay? And he, like in his papers, over and over and over, he says, this, the, the, these, these, ch these evolutionary changes are not from randomness. He says it over and over and over again. It's like he's trying to drive home the point. I've watched this happen. It's not random. He, he, won't, he won't identify himself as an intelligent design guy for, maybe, I don't know, relig religious reasons, philosophical reasons, whatever. What he advocates is a third way. He's saying, he's saying the creationists who say, well, you know, God just put all this stuff here. It's, you can't study it, you know, well, God just made trees and God just made giraffes and God just made people. It's all miracles. And, it's all, it's all yeah. miracles, you can't study that. Right. So he's not going there. 
uh, and he's not with the Darwin. He's like, there's this other version of evolution. And it's the, where the Darwinists would say it was all random. Right. The Darwinists are saying this happens by accident. So it's not miracles, it's not random. The third way? It's a systematic process. Okay. Now, were we talking about that a while ago? Yeah. Science is systematic processes. Mm -hmm. Evolution is an engineered process. The path from single cell to human beings is an engineered process that's following a path. That was pre-engineered? In at some level. At some level. I don't know if it's like pre-engineered to achieve an exact result. Like we want this to end up producing human beings and this is what we're gonna look like, or if it if it is following a its own path to get to whatever it gets to, but that it's building. But that would have to be coded. Yes. Somewhere. Yes. Where is it? And I'm arguing that it was encoded in the first cell. OK. In the, in the non-coding DNA? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Which goes back to the original scientific presumption of the Middle Ages, which was God created the universe with fixed discoverable laws and set it in motion so it was free to unfold without him having to tinker with it all the time. The Big Bang happens and 13 billion years later, look at what we've got. We've got this whole universe and it expanded at a very precise rate and it's got all these amazing characteristics and we have Earth, cool, okay? And I say, and three billion years ago, there was a singularity and then life unfolds mm -hmm. and goes on its path. That's the second singularity you've done. The second okay. singularity. And look, now we have, we have this li living things and we have, uh, th they fill every ecological niche and ecosystems and food chains and all of this. And it's all from the original program. So the original program, the information was coded that, that unfolded through evolution over yes. a long time, that information was encoded originally in yes. the first cell. Yes. So. And that's the second singularity. That's the second singularity.